Hello everyone, welcome to another Guardian Project podcast. I'm Fabiola Maurice, and today I have with me once again one of our founders, David Oliver. Hi, David, how are you? Hi, Fabi, how are you doing? Doing great, I'm happy to have you here. Uh, David is joining us today because he's going to talk about a new technology that could potentially revolutionize the way we store and share information. It's called the Interplanetary File System, or IPFS. David, can you tell us what IPFS is? Sure, thanks, Fabi. The Interplanetary File System is a decentralized file store with a single namespace for all content, no matter where it resides, with the proviso that the owners of those files decide what they want to be displayed or shown in that fashion. IPFS doesn't require central servers. Instead, it's a network of peer computers, often called a peer-to-peer -peer network or P2P. IPFS and many of its software components are key elements of what folks call Web 3.0 or the decentralized web. IPFS started as a project by programmer Juan Bennett who later founded Protocol Labs. And today that's the group that guides this work. Universal file access, um, doesn't HTTP already offer that? Yeah, it does, it does. HTTP expanded the definition of a file's path to include its internet domain and its access protocol. Thus, files were, or more broadly, content in general, not just files, were made universally accessible with this scheme. The full path giving, giving the complete address on the internet for any piece of content. The difference is, that the namespace used by the interplanetary file system is independent of the file's location. In IPFS, content can be cached on any or maybe many IPFS nodes. Dave, I can think of so many things wrong with that idea. For one, how can you find anything? Yeah, that was a head turner for me too. It turns out you don't find it yourself. The identifier for each file on IPFS doesn't give you any hint about if the content type, such as if it's an image or a text file, or its location. And it's hard to memorize these file, these content identifiers, and they're impossible to transcribe. They're just so much gobbledygook text. So instead, you have to let IPFS find things for you using its network of what are called peer nodes, IPFS peers. Your IPFS peers work together to find your file using some IPFS magic, maybe you could say. But this really isn't all that unusual, Fabi. When you think about the disk drive on your computer or the memory storage on your mobile device, these things are managed in a way that's pretty much opaque from applications or the operating system. Those, the applications don't understand, don't really have to deal with the details of how files are actually stored in storage. Instead, there's are, there are subsystems that figure that out. And although IPFS, if you look at, if you hear people talk about the details, it sounds very opaque. In fact, we've been dealing with these layers of complexity for quite some time. Okay, but how can you tell the content is authentic then? It is, it is true that if content can be stored anywhere, you might be suspicious that you received it from a wrong place or maybe that the person or the, the, the facility that delivered you that content has manipulated it somehow. But IPFS actually does a better job of this even than HTTP does. And that's because a file's identifier, the content ID we call it, actually serves as its authenticator because the identifier is based on the concept of a secure hash. Each piece of content creates a unique identifier and that means globally unique. And that identifier can be checked against the file when it's received. So no matter where the file gets delivered from, its content can be tested against the identifier for authenticity. 
it either fails or matches. Even if one character changed or one bit even, there's a dramatically different identifier created. So when you ask for identifier X, only the original content that produced that identifier is valid, no matter where you received it. Then what happens if there are two files on two different computers that have the same content, like just hello world? Yeah, then, then IPFS treats those files as cached versions of the same content because it's true, it seems a little hard to believe if you don't deeply understand the concept of secure hashes, that no matter what computer you're on, if you run the hash algorithm on, on the same piece of content in two locations, it always produces the same result. So what IPFS says, if I have a file that says, hello world, and your file says, hello world, they hash to the same content ID and therefore they're just a cached version of the identify of the identical content, meaning they're the same. Maybe we're on the weeds now. Um, <laughs> it's so important. I know. Why are we going off on this tangent, right? Well, whereas HTTP has location-based addressing, which means the actual location in storage of the file augmented by the domain and the, and the protocol um, gives you an, an exact address. IPFS uses content-based addressing. The problem with HTTP being location-based is that it's easy to block the IP, IP address of the host delivering that content. Since the domain name is part of the actual location, and a domain name resolves to an IP address, you can just block that IP address if you don't want that content seen. On the other hand, on IPFS, its network of peer computers exchange the content and cache the content in a way where it doesn't have to come from its, from its origin address. It can be delivered from anywhere. Like wikipedia.org, a page from, from that site, might get delivered by mytinyhost.net. And nobody would ever be interested in blocking mytinyhost.net. So because the content is freed up from its location, um, blocking IP addresses is useless against IPFS. That's very interesting. Dave, can you tell us if there are other problem or problems that IPFS solve? Yes, although it's kind of a stretch at the moment to think this way, it's sometimes said that IPFS could make the internet's content permanent in the sense of the Internet Archive's Wayback Machine, where you can look at the New York Times homepage from you know, 1994 exactly as it was presented. And and that further, that that content would never go away. Now, you can have a kind of intellectual and technical debate about this idea of whether a permanent web is interesting and why do we need that? But an easier way to, to think about it might be that IPFS really can be used to mitigate the damage caused when websites per permanently go down or whether they modify content from the original content or whether the people who publish the content themselves don't find the content valuable anymore. So sometimes, for example, certain of the news websites just delete their content after two years or something like that. And it's also true that, again, if we're, if, this, if content is undesirable in, from the sense that authorities don't want people to see it, then that content might get removed or the website might get taken down or people arrested. And therefore that content just goes away. So even if you don't believe in the permanent web, this idea that, that things can be reconstituted or made, avail made available elsewhere um, can be really a powerful idea. All right, but 
Why would anyone ever volunteer to start someone else's content, Dave? You know, and we, we said above that content could be available on lots of computers. And you're right, why would anybody just store content? So I think the most valid reason is, is a little bit altruistic. As we say, it's, it's a social reason. And I always point to the example of the project called Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence or SETI. And this is, this is a long time ago and the SETI people who were working on, a, on an aerospace project, the idea of mining um, normal mining the normal data set received from received from uh, radio transmissions that we're monitoring to look for anomalous signals. Well, that took a huge amount of computing power, which they didn't have. So they just asked people, hey, would you run this little piece of code for us? And millions of people said yes, because it was an exciting sort of tantalizing project done by people who had solid credentials and were excited about their work. And people just ran that code on their computer without even thinking about it. So it kind of shows that there's this, people will be involved in things that they perceive as scientifically or socially useful at, for, for no reimbursement, just because they think it's a good goal. And if we look at this idea of storing critical or very useful information for a long time because society needs it, then you can imagine that, that people would be interested in doing that. Also, we know from, the, from Tor's Snowflake project that people are pretty excited to help other people get on the Tor network using this concept of ephemeral bridges or snowflakes and people just volunteer their time. So I think this idea that you can tell people, wow, we want to be able to store things to make sure people in the future get to see that material, then that really might be enough. That really might be the tantalizing part of it, maybe. If not, there's always Filecoin. Wait, what's Filecoin? <laughs> Filecoin is a blockchain cryptocurrency that uses the idea of proof of storage. It's kind of complicated and just like all of the other cryptocurrencies are a little bit hard to define, but the idea is to create a financial incentive for people to take part. So people that agree to store items can be rewarded with file coins, they're called, with, with file coin um, for the amount of items they store and the duration they store them for. And then the Filecoin currency can be exchanged for another currency, whether it's real money or Bitcoin or whatever we happen to believe is valuable in the future. Oh my God, another cryptocurrency. <laughs> yeah, I know, Fabi, yeah, really. <laughs> like it's hard to keep track of and, and what does it all mean? It, it, is, a, it is a very... Uh, um, crazy space, but maybe we shouldn't go, get off on that sort of, there's a lot to talk about there. We, maybe we won't get off on that tangent here. I think the better way to explain it is, is it could be a good way for benefactors to assure that data that they want to have stored gets stored. Maybe it's the transcript of, of um, court proceedings. Maybe it's legal documents. Maybe it's um, monetary documents. Maybe it's photos or audio uh, or podcasts like this, where people are talking about the situation that they're in or having an intellectual discussion that wants to remain as a permanent entity. And maybe there are benefactors who want to assure that those items are stored and they're willing to pay for it. Uh, that gets complicated when you have to set up servers and have people to run them and do all that kind of stuff. Here's an idea where you can just pay with Filecoin. That makes a lot of sense. Now, let's go back to how content moves around inside IPFS. Can you explain that? This is the hardest part to understand. And on, yet it's, it's the thing that makes uh, IPFS so interesting. This idea that content can live anywhere 
and it's available at a unique identifier that always assures its validity. So how does that in fact work? So there are two parts to the process. Um, the first is that IPFS identifiers are not human readable as we said earlier, and they're seemingly random. So there's some process ne necessary, internal process, to use that identifier to find out where it's located. And this is the job of something called a distributed hash table, and specifically a kind called Kademlia, which has certain properties that are designed exactly for this use. Um, we've used this idea of hash tables for a long time in computer science, database style things where we need to map a name to a mailing address, say. So you have a key that maps to a value. Um, but that typically has occurred only on one computer in sort of one file system. With the distributed hash table, that goes, that connects many, many computers across a big, big network. And, and Kademlia imagines that in a way that computers are organized in kind of small groups and all these groups are talking to each other and interchanging so that there doesn't have to be one monolithic network. At any rate, during this process, each of the nodes in the network knows who is closer or farther away from the content you're seeking. So they cooperate to get you closer and closer and closer to the content until you actually find it. And that's the, that's the process of a distributed hash table. And that's about you discovering, oh, my content is over on that node or comes from, originated from that specific node. But to actually retrieve it, there's a second process. And the reason that they're different is because in the second process, the nodes that are working together can cooperate to cache the content nearer to where the requests are coming from. And this has a couple of really interesting properties. First of all, it means that not all the nodes have to be up and available all the time. It even means that the originating node doesn't even have to be there anymore. So they cooperate to get you the information you want as quickly as they can. I like to use the example of the New York Stock Exchange in terms of how this works. These are organized like the Chicago uh, Exchange is located, what they call pits. And people who want to buy stock or sell stock are kind of yelling that, buy order and sell order. And in this case, instead of saying buy and sell, we say want and have. So I want this content ident identifier. And another host says, I have this content identifier. And we exchange information until the file is the file you want is moved onto your computer. It seems like doing a lot of yelling would take a long time. And that's really true. So the reason content moves around the network and is cached closer to where users want it is to eliminate some of that crazy yelling. This all seems crazily complex, eh? Is it really necessary? Well, let's go back to that idea of your computer's file system. Uh -huh. You don't see how that works, but it is a fairly complex thing. It has to, the file system has to map the disk or the memory storage device. It has to understand how that device is organized in terms of sectors or small pieces of storage. It has to move sectors or, or information around when you delete files or add files. It has to stream those individual bits of data off the disk in a way that's fast enough for you to watch a video or something like that. There are these intermediate caches and intermediate types of memory before it gets to really be computed on or viewed. And all of these subsystems to our eyes, if we heard an engineer explain it or watch it, uh, look at a diagram, we would say that's the most crazily complex thing in the world. And right. IPFS is kind of the same way. <laughs> it's, but, but the good news is in both cases, there are kind of software abstractions that make this a little easier. 
And a, a, but a, let me say first that a primary benefit of the approach that IPF uses is this idea of redundancy. And so with content stored in, in multiple locations, any given computer can go down or be unavailable because maybe it's a mobile device not, connect to a net, not connected to the network at the moment. Or maybe somebody just closed the lid of their laptop. If you have a network built in a certain way, that could foul up the entire network. In this case, it barely matters. Somebody else will respond, I have that content. So that redundancy idea is, um, is a really, really good idea. And sort of in the second way, as I said, the, this algorithm for moving content around makes sure that really popular data does get moved. And if somebody tries to block it, they're not gonna be able to do it. So I think, I, I, I think the, the big thing though, is that it all, everything seems com complex until somebody fairly reasonable can sit down and tell you about these layers of abstraction. And in, um, and in, in our case, we, some of these abstractions, these ideas of how software should work underneath IPFS are really important and popular things. And the folks at P Protocol Labs realized that and they make these tools available. They have a library called libp2p or library for personal or peer-to-peer -peer computing. And it's well, it's well documented. It's separate from the idea of the interplanetary file system. So you can use it in different ways. And I think that helps people do more and come up with better and more or more ideas related to these kind of concepts. So one, I, one idea inside there, one little subsystem or abstraction is this thing called publish and subscribe. Right now, if you want to do publish and subscribe, you have to use a big central system like IBM's MQ or Rabbit MQ or Apache's what they call Kafka. And these are wonderful and amazingly high performance systems that serve millions and millions of users. But there's a flaw that there's, they're at a central location that can be blocked. The idea of the way this thing called Gossip Sub works is it's decentralized, just like IPFS, and therefore there's no central location to block. So this idea of message passing can be used in a lot of different things. And maybe we'll find some uses for it right here in Guardian Project. Gosh, that was a lot to grasp. <laughs> what do you think IPFS will have in the internet freedom community? You know, I guess that's what really matters, right, Fabi? I think that, you know, even though, even though I, I, IPFS started in the, in the 2016 timeframe when it really sort of got moving, um, it's still a new technology. We've we still haven't grasped it at a, in a big way like we have the World Wide Web. And at least in the near term, that means that bad actors have not figured out yet how to really undermine it. So we have that problem with, um, with HTTP where people know how to block IP addresses or they, they know how to read the traffic and or profile the traffic. And there's a lot of work you know, that we have to do to, to overcome those hurdles. Well, you know, it's, it's that we're free from that problem with IPFS right now, but it's certainly true that that time will come and we need to start preparing for that time in the future. It certainly, if, I, if IPFS is gonna become the permanent web, we are going to have to keep uh, vigilant about how other people try to undermine it. Um, I think a second benefit, and, and really the big one for me, is this idea of resilience. This idea that, that if we're comfortable, comfortable with the idea that content is, can be stored in many locations and is, is accessible independent of in individual systems going down, that really seems more powerful over time than this idea of I always contact one host for one kind of data. So I'm hoping that this idea catches on for that reason. The second idea is kind of this idea of memory and that does touch on this permanence idea. You know, we hear people say the internet never forgets. You can always look at somebody's tweet from 2000, 
14 and show them that, yes, you did say that so-and-so was a jerk or whatever, you know, <laughs> you know, you did make the claim that you were going to be rich and you're not rich anymore, you know, whatever it is. And, but, but in reality, that's not true. In many ways, the internet does forget. We see articles in newspapers changed without really uh, the citation that it did. We see content removed just because it's the publisher thinks it's no longer interesting or can no longer make money off it. We see that um, you know uh, uh, people are are removing or making things unavailable by censorship without any warning at all, and. There are a wide range of reasons why you might want to have certain of that data around. In many cases, there's data that's not popular, but is extremely useful or maybe even necessary. And that, that sort of weird tension between you know, necessary but not popular means that stuff can get lost. And this is and also true is that using IPFS, these pieces of content are self-authenticating and provide essentially their own attribution. So it's so over time, historically, that can be a very powerful concept. And I think both of these are important in internet freedom. Certainly we have ways that we want to remain private and have our own uh, not the view of the world not being, not being monitored or attacked. That's one thing. But there are other ways where we want information to be known. We want those powerful statements, powerful situations to always be part of society. And I think IPFS can do that. Awesome. Well, David, thank you for taking your time to explain in IPFS to us today. Now, one more thing. Where can people reach you with questions? Yeah, well, Fabi, it was great to be on. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, my email address is david at guardianproject.info, and I'm on Matrix. I use the matrix.org server, and my username is r3ckd at matrix.org on the Matrix uh, messaging system. Thank you very much, Fabi. Thank you, David. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. See you next time. Bye.